Housing Committee, you are in the John Ferraro Council Chamber, room 340. City Hall, the time is 1.05. This committee includes Council Member Felipe Fuentes, Council Member Jose Huizar, Council Member Curran Price, and Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. Mr. Marquise Harris Dawson has been excused for the afternoon. He will not be in attendance. We will wait a uh, minute or two or three uh, for the other members. Thank you. to you for remarks, and then we're going to start just bringing each item up. Okay. We're, you know, my goal is to get these to the floor as quick as possible, integrated, but individual. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, the hour being 1.10, uh, we are prepared to move forward. Uh, Council Member Wizar is with us, who is also the Chair of Planning and uh, Land Use Management and is the Chair of Homeless and Housing Committee, right? Co-Chair. Co-Chair of Homeless and Poverty Committee. Uh, so we are prepared to move forward. We are now joined by my esteemed colleague, the Senator. <laughs> Current price. Mr. Chair, would you like me to read item one? We're joined by Senator uh, Curran Price. Okay, can we take up uh, all items together? Ask, um, uh, can they all be read into the record? Very well. I'll briefly read all seven items. Item one is a motion, Cedillo Harris Dawson lesson instructing HCID and the Department of Transportation to report relative feasibility for using airspace above city owned parking lots for affordable housing. I, item two is a motion, CEO, City of Wezar requesting the city attorney in connection with this Department of City Planning to prepare an ordinance to permit the substitution of one shared parking space for every four required parking spaces for residential. Item three is a motion, City of Wezar instructing the Department of City Planning in consultation with HCID to report with an evaluation of the Greater Downtown Housing Incentive Ordinance. Item four is a motion, City of Fuentes instructing the Department of Building and Safety to report relative to the number of illegal unapproved second units. Item five is a motion, City of O'Farrell instructing the Department of City Planning to report relative to amending the Site Plan Review Ordinance. Item six is a motion, City of Krikorian Wesson instructing the <coughs> Department of Building and Safety <coughs> to report relative to which service fees can be deferred and collected at a later date. Item seven is a motion, City of Wesson instructing the Department of City Planning to report relative to the feasibility of expanding the department's processing expedited processing section to include the review of projects with new environmental impact reports. Thank you. Let me um, let me begin by acknowledging what we all know every day when we get up and that is that we are in a state of an emergency that we are uh, in a crisis. Los Angeles is experiencing a historic housing shortage that is having a detrimental impact on our standard of living, on our quality of life. And it is one that has a, a reach that impacts each and every Angelino uh, within our city. We are the most unaffordable rental market in the nation. And on the home ownership front, we are the second least affordable region 
uh, in the country for people seeking uh, to buy a home. Uh, without solutions to increase our housing stock, we will continue to see the negative impacts of affordability at all levels in the city of Los Angeles. Our production is so low that we were at a high in 2007 with a mere 1,600 units, and we are less than half of that today, while the demand is extraordinary. And we all know it, and we all feel it. If we continue to proceed with business as usual, we will only exacerbate the challenges that confront each and every Angelino, and we will continue to exacerbate the circumstances that confront the homeless community. Having said that, there is no magic bullet to address our long-standing housing crisis. It's going to require many tools uh, in the toolbox, policies from a number of areas to help us bring uh, this resolution. There is no question that an abundance of housing stock would bring some solution uh, to the challenges that confront us. And that is our goal and objective, is that we can move aggressively towards goals established by the mayor and the city. 100,000 units uh, for this region is doable. I believe it. I know it. We have the capacity. Uh, we only need the will and the leadership uh, to move this forward. Uh, I'd like to bring up, uh, first, before I bring up uh, uh, the Department of Planning uh, and the Housing Department, let me hear from my colleagues. Uh, Mr. Price, Mr. Wezar. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm excited uh, to uh, be here as we begin to, um, you know, dis discuss some real alternatives. I think uh, that can make a difference. Uh, anxious uh, for the report facts, uh, but also important. Uh, anxious to hear from uh, those in the audience, who, uh, those who stakeholders, those who've been providing services, those who. Uh, understand and appreciate the real challenges. So I'm, I'm, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wiesner. We have, uh, let's please hear from planning and from uh, H. Sid. Give us a short uh, overview of where we are and our goals of 100,000 units by 2021 as set by uh, the mayor and the challenges that the city faces in building our housing stock. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Ken Bernstein, principal city planner and Department of City Planning. Uh, with me from our department are Lisa Weber, our uh, deputy director, and Matthew Glesney, our uh, housing planner in the citywide policy uh, unit. Uh, first, on behalf of our department, just want to thank uh, council member Cedillo and uh, and the committee for your leadership in moving forward this package of House LA motions uh, and for convening this focused discussion this afternoon on our affordable housing crisis. And thank you as well for starting to tee up uh, the issues, frame the issues that are before us. Just to um, set the scene a, a little bit of uh, some of the issues that underlie all of the motions that are before you this afternoon, as, as you indicated, Los Angeles does have this distinction of being the most unaffordable rental market in the nation. And We've gone from a situation where in 2000, only about 11% of our households were considered rent burdened, paying above 30% of their income for housing. And that figure today uh, is now about half of, of, of all renters in the city. We have the highest percentage of overcrowded units, the highest number of unsheltered homeless persons uh, in the nation. And uh, your council uh, ad hoc committee on homelessness is tackling those issues. And I think we all agree that it is the mismatch between housing supply and demand that is one of the central causes um, of this crisis. And uh, for, for, from the period of 1980 to 2010, the rate of population growth in Los Angeles was nearly 50 percent higher than our rate of housing production uh, in the city. And that mismatch between new housing and population is also a dubious distinction, the highest of any major city in the U.S. So. Uh, that deficit has, that's resulted in a deficit of about 100,000 units in the city, what would be required to house the new population without leading to increased overcrowding. So we are doing our best to not only address our future demand, 
but to make up for this deficit that has been building up for decades. And that very much underlies the mayor's goal of producing 100,000 uh, housing units by 2021. And our long-standing traditional approaches to housing in the city really are no longer available to us. As we know, there are very few places left in the city where we can pursue new greenfield development. We're a built-out city, so new housing requires redevelopment of existing sites. And the resources that we had that uh, Rushmore's uh, department, uh, HCID, had in previous years are no longer available. Cuts in CDBG and home funding. We had the dissolution of the Community Redevelopment Agency uh, and uh, over $100 million of affordable housing funds that would have been available to us were taken back and annual losses of up to $50 million a year in tax increment financing for affordable housing. So. As you said, there is no magic bullet, and we have to look at this range of approaches, uh, both new uh, financing mechanisms as well as planning and land use. And we certainly believe that there's never been a time when, from our perspective in the planning department, that planning and land use tools have been more at the forefront of uh, tackling these affordable housing challenges. And many of those are reflected in the motions you're reviewing today. Many of them had been discussed in our city housing element that was approved in 2013 led by our department in close partnership with, with HCID, which had a variety of policy proposals. And the House LA package is very much about implementing the priorities of the housing element. So our department looks forward to working with, uh, with each of you, with your committee and with the full council to move forward land use strategies to address these issues. I think many of you know that our um, citywide policy team unfortunately has a housing unit of one. Mr. Glesney is our, our one dedicated housing planner He's currently. The man. So we have uh, uh, put forward a, a proposed package that you've already begun to uh, consider in, in another venue. We'll be moving forward to council in coordination with the mayor and CAO to create a dedicated housing unit for our department to be able to move forward this range of creative land use policies. And we look forward to partnering with you. Our hope is that we can have that unit staffed up by April 1st to begin working on uh, this variety of motions and to work closely with your committee um, and the full council in prioritizing those motions and policy proposals, uh, as, as well as those discussed by the Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness uh, as we have that new housing unit ramping up. So again, we're very pleased to be here today and uh, we're all available to answer any questions and work through each of the individual issues. I'll turn it over to Rush. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken, and, and thank you, Council Members. I really want to thank uh, this committee for the leadership with these motions that are before us uh, this afternoon. But I also want to thank uh, the people that are in the audience. Uh, you know, they've come here, uh, taking time out of their busy day because of the pressing issue that we're facing here in the city of Los Angeles. They come here to support and to prod to and to ensure that we as, as uh, stewards of taxpayer dollars, that we do the right things and we put the appropriate resources and make the, the necessary legislative fixes to ensure that we have got appropriate housing for everyone in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, Ken pretty well laid out uh, the uh, dire situation you are with relative to the funding, uh, lack of redevelopment dollars. The entitlement dollars from the federal government are flat, uh, so there aren't much in the way of, uh, of opportunities for new sources other than self-generation. We're looking at the state of California. Obviously, there's discussions of $2 billion being made available for supportive housing. There's discussions here locally about a potential uh, bond issuance. Uh, we're working closely with the planning department, the mayor's office, and this committee relative to a potential benefit fee. Uh, that's been explored before. That's certainly a viable option for the city, as I've mentioned before to this committee and, and the full council, that the city of Los Angeles is the only large city in the entire country that does not currently have its own dedicated source of money for affordable housing or supportive housing. So obviously the, the time is, is now. Uh, in the pipeline, what we have right now, as you all know, we produce the financing for affordable housing. So what we have right now in the queue are 56 projects that are in construction, soon to be in construction, or in the queue to get finance for construction. That's 56 units totaling approximately 3,600 units. 38% of those are for supportive housing. 79% are TOD projects, transit-oriented development projects. So we're aligning our resources where transit's going, or is already in place with enhancements coming in. We're trying to tie uh, our policies to the funding source, tying our, our precious dollars with Measure R dollars as they roll in. As we uh, see in uh, 42 new stations come into the, to the region, we need to align our resources as we change the, the, the face of Los Angeles. 
uh, what's important to note about that number of units that's in the pipeline, that the total development uh, cost for those projects, 56, is approximately $1.4 billion. That's a lot of jobs being created, a lot of homes being created, but from that dollar amount, $1.4 billion to create 50, 56 affordable housing projects or 3,600 units, that tells you the magnitude of the, the actual costs is going to be able, that we need to invest to be able to create and sustain housing for Angelenos. Uh, we welcome these motions. There's uh, obviously, as, as Ken indicated, and we've all indicated, there's no one silver bullet. Uh, financing is one piece. There's non-financial means by which to get there as well. So we're actively working with the planning department to address these matters as well as with building safety as we try to streamline processes and get the, uh, the dollars out the door as quickly as possible to make it easier for developers and incentivize the developers to create more affordable housing, looking at various options by which to fast track these projects. So with that, uh, again, we're, we're also here to answer any questions you may have as we move forward, but we're very excited about having these motions before us now as we move forward to look both at financial and non-financial means by which to address this crisis. Great. Mr. Price? Yeah. Mr. Weaver? Okay, let's move into the, um, uh, thank you very much. Let's move into the motions now. Uh, the first one, it's city-owned land for uh, affordable housing, and I wanna call up the mayor's uh, innovation team You've been doing a lot of work on this. I want to ask you guys to come up to the table and give us an overview about your thoughts on the city's assets and asset management. Hey, good afternoon, Councilman. I'm Mark Anthony Thomas. I'm the director of the Mayor's Operations Innovation Team. And this afternoon we'll share with you our real estate initiative, which responds to a lot of the requests that we found with the council that really want to leverage the city's assets for a number of initiatives. So I'll introduce Shamel Graham, who actually gave our presentation. Good afternoon, Councilman. Thank you for the opportunity to present. We understand that uh, council has many concerns and understands the importance of leveraging city-owned real estate um, as our valuable resources to support various initiatives such as the affordable housing crisis. And an the assets are subject of a number of committees, including entertainment and facilities, economic development, this committee, ad hoc on a uh, comprehensive job plan. What we've discovered is that there are several operational challenges when it comes to the management of city-owned assets, including the need for comprehensive real estate data and the need for a proactive strategic citywide plan. The impact on the city is such that there's an inventory of, uh, a large inventory of underutilized vacant and blighted buildings and also missed opportunities to spur economic growth and respond to market changes. And so our approach to reform has been to identify and quantify all of our city-owned real estate assets, understand existing operations and best practices, and provide collaborative leadership. Hello, Councilman. Uh, to identify and quantify the city's real estate assets, we worked with the county assessor to set up baseline. Uh, we then gathered uh, over 30 lists that have been maintained by the city departments capturing the city's real estate assets. Uh, we've been working to consolidate all that data down uh, by matching and removing duplicates. And uh, along the way, we're really understanding and mapping what real estate assets the city owns. Along the way, though, uh, we have some initial findings to share with you all. Uh, this includes a baseline assessed value of $1.8 billion. Uh, we know this is undervalued given current uh, market conditions. And we know there's at least 7,700 uh, assets or parcels of land uh, within city limits. There have been some challenges along the way, uh, one of which includes uh, there are 55 different ways in which ownership by the city of LA, uh, its departments and agencies are categorized. That's 55 different ways. And so now we have identified, um, based on our initial findings, the big vision for reform, which is establishing a coordinated uh, management of our real estate portfolio and a structure to support municipal, economic, and civic priorities. So that includes the asset management framework, looking at a comprehensive, again, uh, portfolio management strategy, and looking at the city's deal-making capacity. Within that, we've identified three key challenge areas. 
one being the establishment of performance metrics and information sharing capacity, the real estate portfolio programs and opportunities that the city has, and the establishment of a management structure. And then within each challenge area, we've identified various initiatives that are listed. So our next steps include collaborating with council and all electeds to build out a reform plan and develop immediate and long-term recommended actions, engage the expertise to map out success and determine the best path for implementation of our various initiatives, and also the assignment of long-term placement of roles and responsibilities when it comes to the management of the city's real estate assets. Does the council have any questions? What's the, so what's the status <laughs> of all this? I mean, do, do, do we have a, a list? Do you have, uh, you said you're compiling uh, data from a variety of sources. Has that compilation been accomplished yet? Or what's, what's, what's where yes, we, we do have a, a baseline county list uh, where, where there's a challenge that we're working through now is that all the departments have been maintaining what they believe their assets include. And so you may have one parcel that appears on the foreclosure registry, but it also may be being operated by a department. And so we're actually having to consolidate what is what we consider good data and then segment out all that data that actually needs to be cleaned. Uh, and so that's gonna take us some additional time to really feel comfortable sharing at least what we think is a, is a valid list. Uh, in the interim, we're getting the department up on an asset management system that they can start actually tracking and making these changes and really start appropriately looking at comprehensively how we leverage the assets. So all departments now are, are feeding into a single system? Yes, and so now they're actually using you know, Excel basic spreadsheets. Um, and so we've had to consolidate all of that information. The interim system is really a prelude to a much larger system that the city's in the current process of procuring. So we're making progress. Thank you. We're making a lot of progress. That's good to know. Yeah, and this has been like a 15 plus year effort that we actually think in a few months we've shown a lot of progress on. Thank you. Yeah. So I know you're at the beginning of, of pulling all these um, various, I'll just say various lists together and trying to sort out, make sure we don't have duplication. It's impressive the number is 1.8 billion or 7,700 parcels. Are there any uh, characteristics about the parcels that you're seeing? One and two, are there any recommendations, any sense about what are the, like, the low hanging fruit, the things that we could take advantage of uh, immediately? Yeah, I, d I definitely think in, in what we have, there are some parcels that could be used for immediate action. Uh, we do have parcels that are already categorized as surplus that the city could sell. Um, and so all of those operations, when we speak to the deal making mm -hmm. and the transaction capacity, that's where we're looking at how the departments operate and making sure they can move forward on these types of decisions. Uh, the strategy around the overall system is really just not at the level that we actually need it to be. And so there is some work that we're gonna have to do to really make sure that that capacity is built up. But we can do those types of things pretty fast. What's the next steps for the council in working with you? How do we help you facilitate this? Helping really understand what are your initiatives and what are your priorities. Uh, we'll be able to provide that information that you've wanted. Uh, and then from there, work with us to really make sure that whatever decisions that are recommended are in the best interest of the city and are really aligned to the goals. Mr. Weezer? I'm fine, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, do you distinguish in terms of putting your list together distinctions between housing, bricks and mortar, long term, and then say, uh, in my area, we have a need for a safe parking program. Mm -hmm. Are you making distinctions? Or are you just simply preparing information for us? Yeah, right, right now is the preparation of information. Uh, once you get into those types of decisions, mm -hmm. then you actually, that's where the collaboration is key. Uh, because we don't actually wanna be in a position of where we're advising 
uh, yet, but we do want to be able to build the city's capacity up so that we can get that type of expertise on a reoccurring real-time basis so that we can actually move forward on whatever initiatives are in the best interest of the city. Okay. So I, I it sounds like it's premature, but I want to ask you to continue to work with the CAO and our offices in terms of um, the CAO's report on pilots. Okay. Right? Uh, on both affordable housing, but also on um, other homeless facilities that we could use uh, on these properties, stuff that we've talked about, whether it be shelter okay. or safe parking or uh, storage. Uh, we have two pages here. One page is bricks and mortar and how do we deal and march towards 100,000 units and leverage those properties. And then we have that sense of urgency for immediate shelter, for storage, for the kind of uh, things that are called upon through this um, state of emergency shelter ordinance that we have in place right now. So those are like, both, both, both are needed and then we uh, want you to think about those as with the CAO in terms of some recommendations you could report back or that the CAO would report back to us. Uh, this would be part of the homeless strategy recommendation 6D in the, in the CAO's report. Okay, we okay. can do that. Anything else? Good. Okay. Good. okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna keep you guys up here. But... Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to work with you and thank you for your previous work in cleaning up our city. Can I get planning back up? With respect to parking, construction costs are one of the main reasons many points, many people point to for the high cost of, of housing. Parking spaces range from 25,000 to 40,000. And when the city continues to encourage people out of their vehicles, it's prudent that our land use policies also reflect that. Uh, I'd like, I saw Rush, are you, Rush, I thought you were coming up to the desk. Uh, I'd like the department to talk about the different programs currently being used to reduce parking requirements and how car sharing can help expand on that. How does the city of Los Angeles compare to other major metropolitan cities and their parking requirements? Uh, in your experience in building permanent supportive housing, do projects take advantage of current programs to reduce parking? Uh, requirements. Gentlemen. Thank you again, Ken Bernstein, Department of City Planning, and again, we very much appreciate this motion on uh, on parking. Um, as you indicated, parking is a key piece of the affordability puzzle. It is uh, <coughs> extremely expensive to construct parking spaces in Los Angeles, and traditionally, we've had a situation where most units have required two parking spaces. Um, this is an issue our department has recognized for for some time, and we have been taking steps to be more uh, creative, innovative in our regulation of parking. Um, in Council District 1, as an example, our CASP, uh, Cornfield Arroyo Seco specific plan, was among the first plans in the city really to deregulate parking and eliminate uh, parking requirements in that uh, new specific plan area. We have also worked on that in, uh, in downtown Los Angeles, uh, and uh, it's been extremely successful in incentivizing housing through the adaptive reuse ordinance. And so we're looking at taking those lessons learned, uh, bringing them um, citywide. Uh, these are issues that we are w working on um, through our Recode LA effort, our comprehensive uh, overhaul of the city zoning code. Uh, where uh, we are looking comprehensively at these parking standards and we'll have the opportunity to develop community-specific, uh, more customized uh, parking standards. We also are in the process right now of uh, looking at uh, parking uh, availability, parking supply, through work that we're doing, uh, a consultant study that our department is undertaking um, looking at reforming our California Environmental Quality Act review, we are actually doing a comprehensive count of available parking spaces as a prelude to be able to develop some of these more creative parking policies. So we very much welcome this motion, uh, which directs us to work in 
uh, coordination with the city attorney to look at um, shared vehicle uh, parking spaces as a next extension of where we've been going with parking and uh, we look forward to, uh, to reporting back. We also are uh, closely monitoring the new state requirements of the new state incentive, AB 744, which significantly reduces uh, parking requirements uh, and uh, is a new incentive, uh, particularly uh, around transit and tied to um, infill development. So we look forward to monitoring the impacts of, uh, of those results as well and look forward to working with you and the uh, housing department in taking this further. Right. I would just add a couple of uh, quick notes. First, as I mentioned in my, uh, my opening comments, that uh, approximately 80% of our, our uh, projects in the pipeline are transit-oriented development. Uh, utilizing less parking space as well as creating shared parking spaces for the public transportation. Uh, the city also received a grant to look at shared parking, uh, shared vehicles, electric vehicles. So that's a pilot program where I believe uh, over 100 vehicles are going to be purchased. We're looking at affordable housing projects throughout the city whereby we can utilize parking space within the parking structures of the affordable housing projects and or adjacency to those uh, affordable housing projects adjacent to transit stops so that whereby we could utilize this grant as a pilot program to see how this car sharing would uh, work and if we can expand upon it from there. Uh, <coughs> working with the affordable housing developers, we are always looking for uh, minimizing parking as much as possible. We've even seen uh, a senior uh, housing project in Chinatown where there were no parking at all. It was all tied to transit. So we're seeing variations of that and, and looking forward to this working on this motion so that we can come up with better strategies to uh, reduce the amount of parking. Very good. Mr. Mr. Senator so, Price. So there have been, um, you mentioned the, the project in Chinatown where there's no parking. So it's got kind of an ad hoc basis now? Is there, there is an adjacent there's parking lot that people can Let's utilize, but uh, it's designed for people to utilize the public transportation that's adjacent to uh, the gold line. And the, the whole design is to promote uh, the seniors, to, if they do need transportation, uh, to utilize the public transportation. There is uh, an option off-site, but it's really a change in, in how people uh, are living to uh, do away with the, uh, the reliance on uh, parking within the structure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wiesner. Okay. Good. I, I'd like to see the uh, report back include um, lowering parking requirements uh, for permanent supportive housing as outlined in Homeless Strategy Recommendation 8C. Okay. We'll talk about micro units. Uh, can you touch upon uh, the Greater Downtown Housing Incentive Ordinance uh, and if we've seen much production of micro units uh, in that area? Um, What's the trend we're seeing in regards to micro units across the country in New York, for example? Uh, there's just a story in the LA Times about some very small units, I think three, 400 square feet um, that were uh, recently uh, developed. Uh, what are the barriers that we face in Los Angeles uh, in building these micro units? We certainly know that uh, in other cities uh, throughout the country, micro units are utilized. Uh, they have not been utilized extensively in the city of Los Angeles, certainly not by design. What we have seen on occasion are uh, in the downtown area where you've got smaller units uh, uh, being converted into micro units. Uh, but by and large, that has not been the norm, and certainly that's something the department has contemplated as we go forward, uh, looking at affordable housing, uh, the development, and of course, the, the sheer price uh, per unit is, is rather absorbent, so uh, creating a smaller unit size, but making, but you know, with, with the counter that as we're creating certainly supportive housing and affordable housing that we want to create a, a, a long-term solution for these individuals where it's a, a true success versus just a, a, just a living quarters and nothing else. So we want to balance the, the economics with a, a humane uh, living quarters. So we're, we're anxious to look at options to the, where perhaps we can utilize on a pilot basis uh, to see what, that would, what the long-term impact would be for the city. I would just add again, the, the motion is asking our two departments to collaborate on a, on a report back evaluating our existing models for um, micro units such as the, the Greater Downtown Housing Incentive Ordinance and, and we look forward to providing that study. Again, this is building on, uh, I think, directions that we have, are going in and have wanted to move in 
uh, both in downtown, again in, in, in the CASP, the direction I think uh, that we all want to see in providing more, uh, a greater range of housing, particularly for uh, seniors, for young people who uh, are looking at non-traditional um, housing units, non-traditional ways of living. Um, we are uh, particularly interested in certainly pursuing micro units at transit centers uh, where there, there certainly is an opportunity again to um, as well provide a more affordable price point, uh, also providing housing for those who are most likely we hope to use the transit system and reinforce our investment in transit. We are uh, looking at uh, as well uh, our evaluating our density bonus programs in the city. There may be opportunities to consider this um, as part of evaluations of density bonus. And again, as I mentioned, Recode LA has been looking at, uh, at these issues and we'll be continuing to consider that as part of Recode. But we look forward again to the collaboration on the report back to give uh, the committee some policy options. Okay, so uh, in your report back, please include micro units as part of uh, permanent supportive housing as outlined also in the homeless Strategy Recommendation 7L. Let's talk about the Granny Flats uh, accessory, what's called accessory dwelling units. I'm sorry. Do you want any comments? No, sir. You're good. Um, backyard homes can provide an important housing option to both potential renters and uh, homeowners. Please tell us what the city's current policy is on these Granny Flats. Uh, why we have not complied with AB 1866 that approves uh, these granny flats uh, and began to approve them in 2002. Okay, um, so the, the city has been uh, complying with and, and relying upon our state law, which is AB 1866, which was passed in 2002, and that encouraged Ken, before, the- Ken, before, I know I'm cutting you off, but can I also get Frank from Building and Safety up? Go ahead, Ken, finish and then. Um, so AB 1866 at the state level encourages the provision of secondary units. It, it provides a general set of state standards that applies unless cities develop their own regulations. The city of Los Angeles is in compliance with state law, but we do not have a specific tailored local ordinance uh, that uh, in a way would supersede uh, the, the state regulations. So, the, um, the approach of the city has been really to rely upon AB 1866. The results have been that uh, we are only seeing about 50 uh, legalized units uh, per year, mostly about 90% of those in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, and uh, the, our department is certainly very interested in revisiting uh, our approach to this state law and looking at a, uh, again, a more tailored local ordinance uh, in conjunction with the Department of Building and Safety to deal with some of the code obstacles for the provision of these backyard units or, or secondary units. We also do have the, uh, the mayor's innovation team uh, here that is also uh, beginning to do some work in this area in collaboration with, with our departments and um, I, I think they could uh, add to, to the discussion in terms of what's, what's being considered. Okay. Mr. Price. As a part of this uh, the unapproved second unit, does this include garage conversions as well? Or is that well, another category that we need to look at? It can. Um, one of the things that uh, Building and Safety, Frank Bush from Building and Safety, um, good afternoon. One of the things that, uh, that we utilize in Building and Safety is in response to the AB 160, 1866, um, there's a, a zoning administrator, a ZA, it's called ZA Memorandum 120, which uh, sets out some requirements, minimum requirements for the zoning issues uh, on the uh, requirements on the property. And we use that on a regular basis when they come in. It could include garage conversions. Someone could apply for a permit and, and try to utilize this. There are restrictions in the zoning code because of the the side yard, rear yards, and a lot of, that's a lot of the conflict that we run into on these um, quite often in there. But we do utilize this, and uh, if 
it, it would be good to reevaluate it and, and uh, look to see if we can make some changes. And as was mentioned, uh, an official ordinance that would describe and, and give the allowances in there for these. It would help us to permit them a lot easier. So is your, rec is your report going to recommend uh, <clears throat> further changes in that or adopting it to continue to, uh, to uh, yeah, I think the, the motion the here state is state law or to make it more stringent, more restrictive? Yeah, I think the motion here is directing all of us to work together uh, to come up with an ordinance that would address these and make them easier to, uh, to permit. What's the numbers on, on uh, tell me how you process and the numbers on tracking illegal units and um, how many do you think are out there? And so I'm trying to get to how we can bring these online and then go to the net gain on, on, on units here. Mm -hmm. I don't have an official number for you on right. how many units are because we, we have, a, there's a lot of variations how our complaints, we respond, only respond to complaints and building and safety on the, the single family dwelling properties. So they can come in as, they could come in as a garage conversion, they could come in as an illegal use, there's all different types in there. So um, we will work on ru trying to run a number and searching, doing word search in our system to see if we can come up and, and actually give a number. Um, one of the things I can tell you is that when we get a, um, a complaint about a garage conversion or uh, let's say a shed is converted, any type of conversion is on there, we don't do an immediate vacate. We don't vacate so you have to get out unless there's an imminent hazard. If there's an imminent hazard to the occupants, then we do in that case uh, do that. Uh, but we will work with them. Otherwise, the, the orders just tell them to get them legalized or restore it back to what it was. So, uh, but I, we're going to work on getting numbers. Uh, they won't, may not be perfect because, uh, like I said, we have to word search the system. Right. Okay. Just, a, just a quick important note here that that's the single family. As as you well know, the multifamily is under separate track. Where we're looking, working closely with the planning department uh, and this uh, committee. Uh, looking at uh, the grandfathering in of those illegal units, provided that there is, uh, uh, they meet this, the appropriate codes, and of course there's going to have to be some variances that have to be created to, uh, in the zoning to permit uh, additional units. Say, for instance, if you've got an eight-unit building with uh, eight parking spaces, now you're going to legalize two illegal units. Then, of course, uh, that's uh, two more units than you have parking spaces for. So we're working with the planning department uh, and uh, building and safety in this committee, and we'll be coming back with those options on the multifamily side. So it's the single-family, multifamily side. Both are, are major issues that we're trying to address. I would just add on the multifamily ordinance that is going to planning commission in, in the next couple of months and it would tie the legalization of those uh, units to uh, long-term affordability. So we would be avoiding the eviction of tenants that occurs today and also creating a, a, a more permanent source of affordable housing in, in many of those units. So, is so, so what's the effect of us not having an ordinance to implement AB 188? 66 versus having a memo or administrative guidelines on on uh, on this issue. Well, again, we, we do uh, comply with state law. We're providing the the minimum for the minimum requirements of state law, and we are processing uh, you know some applications based on that zoning administrator's uh, memo. But uh, a local ordinance would allow us to create a more tailored set of uh, regulations that we think work for the city of Los Angeles and, we, and that we hope would also um, remove some of the, the barriers that we have found in practice, uh, limit the ability of many properties to accommodate such units. Okay, and there's some things moving down the pipeline right now to um, work with the illegally converted garages, um, but then we're gonna work on this ordinance coming through. What, is, is this gonna supersede that or, or how do you plan to how should we approach that? Well, actually, this, this is going to be done uh, on a separate track. Could be, the multifamily happens to be going first. Uh, the motion you have before you this, uh, this afternoon is on the single family. At okay. some point, they may connect. But by and large, uh, as Ken indicated, uh, that, that ordinance is, is, is going to be before uh, the Planning Commission here relatively soon. Uh, so that we will be able to begin in earnest uh, taking those properties that uh, with the property owners that are uh, come forward and want to legalize a, a pre-existing or pre-existing units they can come forward uh, these people there's people already residing in these units uh, it's 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 uh, prudent that we create uh, a living space where these people can live safely 
and uh, legally and create affordability as Ken indicated on top of that. So then further beyond that, then we've, we've got a major, major issue with the single family as well. So uh, I believe you'll see the, the multifamily go first, uh, single family shortly thereafter. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Can we get the mayor's uh, innovation team to come up and discuss their work on this? Good afternoon, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here to speak with you. Uh, my name is Amanda Dalflos, I'm the director of the Mayor's Innovation Team. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here both to tell you just a little bit about our team and what we've been focused on and then also to talk specifically about um, the secondary unit piece that uh, Mr. Bernstein um, and others have already described. Um, really briefly, the Innovation Delivery Team is a team that um, comes to the city from a Bloomberg grant that the city won last December. Um, the team has been asked to focus on the topic of inclusive neighborhood revitalization. Um, so as cities around the country, not just LA, um, change, we've been asked to look at really what are the factors in that change, um, what is the outcome of that change, and then probably most importantly, what are things that the city might be able to do um, to support neighborhoods in changing. Um, and then from the point of view of both business and res residential displacement and helping um, our communities stay in place or change uh, with the natural forces. Um, so in doing that work, um, one of the things that's um, come up for us is really the, the secondary unit ordinance that is um, before you now and the conversation that, that's happening in the community. Um, I think we're very excited about the opportunity to work with planning, building and safety, um, and others that have already spoken today uh, to support that work and support the, the ordinance and the formulation of that ordinance, um, taking AB 1866 and making that something um, that is appropriate for the local domain, um, and then thinking about programming that over the course of, we hope to see the next one to two years. Um, so we've given some thoughts of what that might look like, and we'd be happy to come back and speak with you certainly more at length um, in partnership with um, building and safety, planning, and the others in the community that we've been working with. Uh, so I think really briefly that is the work that we've uh, been focused on. Again, very excited about the opportunity to partner with you all, um, as well as planning, building, and safety, and others and would certainly be happy to, to take any questions specifically or answer anything that, um, that, that comes up for you. Sarita? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I would like uh, planning to come back with an ordinance that allows for the development of the ADUs, the granny flats, in accordance with current state law and also report back on a program um, bringing the illegal units to compliance as affordable units uh, and as outlined in the homeless strategy report recommendation 7k thank you very much thank you let's talk about site plan review good afternoon council members lisa weber deputy director with the city's department of Bil uh, <laughs> department of city planning uh, we're here today to address uh, your request for us to consider comprehensively a modification to our site plan review procedures. Currently, the threshold for site plan review is 50 units and uh, 50,000 uh, square feet of non-residential development. Um, we, in fact, are comprehensively looking at modifying that as part of our Recode LA efforts, and as Mr. Bernstein mentioned, that's the comprehensive overhaul of our six to seven year old zoning code. So we're looking at a variety of entitlements and discretionary procedures, looking at um, streamlining those and potentially eliminating some of those, possibly creating some what is now a discretionary process, making them an administrative clearance process, which would be a function out of our development services center uh, in a deep counter function. So we're very open to looking at this. We're also looking at the new zoning forms as a way to better address uh, the need uh, to ask for variances. For example, with better zoning, there will be less discretionary actions that are needed. Uh, also, with the use of uh, context, uh, for example, in urban context, perhaps the threshold for site plan review is 100,000 square feet and 100 units. In other contexts, maybe it's lower, for example, a uh, more rural or uh, suburban neighborhood. So we're very open to exploring that. We're moving forward. We do expect to have a comprehensive, comprehensive set of new processes and procedures available uh, for review uh, later this calendar year as part of Recode. Ken? 
How, how the, where did 50 come from? I, I, I think that's uh, significant to try to contextualize it. You know, ex-urban at the edges of, you know, LA County versus the various San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley versus, you know, the TLD centers and the um, urban core of our city. It's, it's been in place for quite some time and it was really a catch-all when there were no other discretionary actions such as a zone change or a conditional use permit or a variance being requested. And it's something also that uh, triggered a CEQA review. Okay. So quite often it would give, afford us the ability to look at it from an environmental standpoint as well. Okay, so please uh, incorporate uh, recommendation 7M from the homeless strategy in your report back, uh, which speaks on potential amendments to site plan review ordinance. Okay. Thank you. Uh, building and safety, is that you, Frank? On uh, deferment of fees. That's Dean. Thank you, Steve. Tell us about uh, deferment fees that you, or the different fees you collect, and what's your recommendation on a better central process for collecting these? Uh, where is it appropriate? Where are deferments appropriate, et cetera? Good afternoon, Steve Ongel of the Department of Building and Safety. Um, we've read the motion, we've talked to the CAO. Uh, we did preliminary uh, review. We collect over 13 different types of fees uh, when folks come in to uh, request permits and request to uh, to do plan check. <coughs> On those uh, more than 13 different types of fees, uh, only two or three fees actually do belong to building and safety. The rest of them belong to uh, LAUSD, some of them to the state and some to the other departments. Uh, we actually decided to sample um, like one project, uh, about 1,200 square feet. Um, the cost coming to uh, about uh, $7,000. Out of that $7,000, 4000 is for LAUSD. Uh, gives you um, a glimpse into how difficult this is going to be. But in our discussion with the CAO, we've determined that uh, we could potentially use general fund monies to front fund and to defer the cost if it's approved by city council. Um, Mr. Price? Yeah. I mean, front fund, too. What, what do you mean? To, to supplement that uh, that $4,000 figure, for example, or what, what, what would the, what would our approach be? You say of the, of the, uh, that allotment, 4000 goes to the school district. That's correct. For example. And so what was the, what did the CAO say we could do to offset that or? Um, it's, it's not doing, necessarily doing anything to offset that. To say the truth, uh, I don't think that any of, any of that fee can be uh, deferred without finding a general fund money to actually collect that. So what, what council would do is council would set aside funding, same, same as uh, council does for sanitation for the lifeline um, to help folks who can't afford it and who are elderly and disabled. So council normally sets aside some money every fiscal year to, f to pay for that. So in this case, council would actually set aside money to front fund um, the plan check and permit fees, and eventually when the projects are completed, um, the, uh, the developers will have to, uh, to reimburse the city council, mm -hmm. or re reimburse the general fund, rather. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, what's, what's the, um, what would be the impact on the deferral of those fees, though? So we're not saying we're not going to collect them. We're just going to collect them at a different uh, place in the sequence. The impact of not collecting the fees or not or collecting it later? Collecting it later. Um, so for example, we have to give LAUSD a whole bunch of money. Correct. Right? Uh, the state gets some money. Correct. Right? We may not have discretion over that, but the city gets money. Um, I guess for infrastructure, for costs uh, that the uh, development will uh, in encumber, right? We've got to pay for lights and water and plumbing and 
and infrastructure, but but clearly that's not necessary until later in the process. So what's uh, what's the consequence of deferring that component part? Um, that is a fee that is not necessarily um, collected by the Department of Building and Safety. Some of those for, for sewer, uh, I believe, is collected uh, at the beginning of the process, potentially by, uh, by Bureau of Engineering, or let me just say Public Works, because uh, infrastructure is actually um, a function of Department of Public Works. So they would collect those fees, and we have no idea. The only thing that we do is we do have a sign-off that's required. So until those fees are paid and we get a sign-off from Public Works, uh, we cannot proceed with the project, or we cannot provide um, a building permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So, Council Member, I just want to add that we are working with the CAO, this, the Office of the CAO, to uh, to respond to this motion, and it is possible that we will have proposals in that response after this motion is uh, passed on. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, item seven, expediting the review of EIRs. Uh, let's talk about how long it takes to uh, some of these cases to actually become a real project. Uh, I had an initial experience coming into to this office. We have an incredible project that had been developed or planned was ready to go forward in three blocks uh, next to my district office. Um, about 80 units would have come online. Incredibly well <laughs> thought out, well, well designed, and uh, affordable housing, uh, supportive housing. We wouldn't lose one spot of parking. Uh, there were some community benefits. And there was even opportunities for uh, low-income home ownership. And uh, two and a half years down the road, we continue to wait while we have to struggle to get housing and shelter for homeless people. These units aren't being built because I think with $800, somebody could file a uh, EIR and, um, and block a project. Currently, uh, I'm told that there's 49 pending ERR cases, and that's holding up 23,700 units of housing. 23,700 units of housing is being held up by 49 of these cases. And that number 23,700 is just about matches perfectly with the number of homeless people uh, in this city today. So talk to me about uh, uh, how long it takes and how we can uh, move forward. Okay, certainly. Again, this is Lisa Weber with the Department of City Planning. Um, several years back, we created a dedicated section of our department for major projects. And those are cases that involve the preparation of an environmental impact report required by CEQA. I have some updated numbers for you, uh, Councilman, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the number of EIRs. Um, they're flooding in. We have about 56 active uh, projects right now involving the preparation of an EIR. The good news is, is that we have a dedicated team uh, with a uh, technical staff uh, within our environmental unit, uh, 15 uh, technically trained planners with a dedicated associate zoning administrator uh, overseeing our citywide plan project planning operations and a dedicated senior city planner that originated from our expedited uh, case processing section. Um, updated numbers, uh, we have 24,180 multifamily developments that are pending. Uh, in those EIRs, 574 single family homes. So, 24,180 multifamily units uh, being captured within those projects involving the 56 environmental impact reports. Um, that that uh, unit is, is doing well. The nature of environmental impact reports, it does take a bit of time because of the number of technical, um, uh, technical studies uh, required to prepare the various sections regarding greenhouse gases, air quality, traffic, noise, et cetera. Um, but currently there is no backlog. That's why we have a dedicated section. We are asking for two additional planners, a city planner and associate 
uh, planner uh, for that section so that we can keep up with the pace of EIRs coming in. Uh, with regard to overall case processing uh, department-wide, we are moving, um, thanks to uh, the budget approval from the last fiscal year, moving forward with our geographic restructuring of our case processing operations. This is going to enable us to fully realize the one project, one planner approach, where all planners will be trained to uh, manage and direct all discretionary um, case types, whether it's director, commission, advisory agency, or zoning administrator. That is moving forward. Uh, we just made uh, 12 senior city planner uh, promotion appointments that will help create that management structure to, to um, fully realize that. So our, our case processing numbers are, are bec becoming quick. Uh, with regards to environmental impact reports on a best case scenario, EIRs take about six months uh, to produce uh, a draft environmental impact report, again, with a lot of back and forth, working very closely with the applicant team and their environmental consultant team. So six months is the norm, six months is? For an environmental impact report, which, you know, some of these reports are the length of this table. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with all of the technical studies and appendices, that, that's typically about right. A lot of it, uh, uh, there is, is some downtime on the planner's part uh, because a lot of those, again, that technical analysis is uh, conducted by the applicant team. And so there is a little bit of, of, of stopping and starting which allows us to juggle, each planner juggles about uh, four to six environmental impact reports at a time. And they're able to do that as they, they come and go. Uh, do you have any ideas on how we can expedite this? Well, again, additional staff resources allows us to, uh, you know, spread out uh, the workload uh, among more resources. So um, that team um, is, is doing great. We have a, num a number of major projects that will be hitting a major milestone this calendar year, going to both the City Planning Commission as well as to Plumbing Council. Uh, some of those are actually already on the advanced calendar for the City Planning Commission this spring. Uh, one of those is the Cumulatus Project. It's located in Council District 10, and it involves uh, the development of 1,200 multifamily, multifamily units. Wow. Any ways to shorten that process to come to mind? You know, a CEQA reform is, is really um, uh, where, we can, where we can use some help. Um, you know, we're working comprehensively across our department on a variety of CEQA measures. Uh, what we often find is a lot of these uh, developers are voluntarily pursuing the preparation of an EIR when in fact uh, they, it may only be technically appropriate for them to prepare a mitigated negative declaration. So an environmental impact report has, has a much more robust uh, scoping process, um, notification process, circulation process for the document and there's requirements for a point by point response. Uh, to, to any comment received from anybody on the draft environmental impact report. So by its very nature, it's lengthy. The more that we can do to streamline CEQA um, a across the board, update our CEQA thresholds, I, I think that's, that's where we're really gonna make a difference. And that work is underway. We're working on that on a number of fronts throughout our department. Unfortunately, it's, it's often the threat of litigation by, by opposition groups that, that trigger the creation or the preparation of environmental impact report. Right. Very familiar with that. Thank you. And comments? Yes, yes. Misa. Yes. Well, thank you. I certainly look forward to uh, the response to this request um, to get more information as, uh, as to how we could expedite um, affordable housing to the uh, through our processes, but I think you're correct. Um, EIRs, if we're, if we have an expediting um, section uh, in the city, by nature EIRs have um, certain timelines and review processes, community uh, input processes that it, 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 trying to mesh those timelines with an expediting unit may, not, may or may not make sense. 
Uh, I think you're right. We have to look at the CEQA itself to see how we could have CEQA reform. I know there's been a lot of talk at the state level to have CEQA reform. It's failed in the last few sessions, but uh, certainly if anything we could do with our own local guidelines as to CEQA, when it comes to CEQA, anything we could um, allow for the public input that we uh, would like to see, but at the same time find ways to shorten those periods, um, you know, any recommendations as we get back this report would certainly be appreciated. Okay. Um, Thank you. Let me say that, uh, for the record, we want to consolidate all the council files on today's agenda. Okay. Before we get to uh, what our final recommendation is, uh, we're going to do public comment. And let's begin with Mr. Tony Salazar from McCormick Barron Salazar. Mr. Salazar, please come up. I know we've had some experiences with CEQA and uh, you are one of the premier builders of affordable housing uh, in the country. Please talk to us about what those uh, experiences are and what we could do in California so that we no longer are distinguished as the most costly city in the nation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Councilman Wiesar, Senator Price. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's been a while since I've been down here at, uh, at City Hall to talk about policy. Uh, but uh, today I feel compelled to be here because I think the, the, the initiative that's being proposed is very substantive, very thoughtful, and I think uh, City Fathers would be good to move quickly to uh, both pass them and introduce them and get them implemented. You know, the things that um, we, we house over 70,000 people every night in, in developments that we've developed across this country. Uh, we have over 2,000 units just here in, here in Los Angeles. Um, you know, there, to meet the affordable housing demand, you know, we need land to develop. We need subsidy to, to fill the gaps to, to make these developments work. Um, and we need a partner in City Hall to um, cut the red tape and streamline the approval process. Thank you. Uh, but I think the, 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 the issues that, uh, and, and it isn't just one, it's a combination of all. And uh, in, in an effort to, to make that happen, uh, we have been involved here uh, for, for quite a while now just doing TOD uh, projects. One of the things I hope that you would consider um, in addition to addressing the availability of land and improving the planning and entitlement process, is, is, in, the planning, is in the parking issues, uh, as, as, as you know in, in our TOD projects in your, some of your districts, is that we provide each household with a monthly metro pass. Because it's, it isn't just about reducing the number of parking, it's making sure that people who live near a transit stop actually use it because what's been happening out here and what we've been involved in for much too long is building uh, housing developments around transit stops, but building two parking spaces for, you know, to accommodate people with their Beamers and, and, and their Mercedes Benz. We have to get used to uh, riding mass transit in this city. We have to get used to density. We have to get used to accommodating housing and, and people and families, not just building smaller units, but building family units. Because right now, we're, we're, uh, the more we continue to build smaller units, the more we're forcing people to drive until they find affordability, and they're, and they're ending up living in spaces not near uh, transit stops. So, Thank you. Uh, my, my, my last comment, Mr. Chairman, is that I support this initiative on how it addresses these issues. Uh, I remain in full support, and anything I can do to help move these along uh, feel free to call on me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Salazar. Christine uh, Rangel from uh, the BIA. I have a representative from the United Way of Greater Los Angeles. I have Mr. Adam Cowen from Public Council. Please prepare to come forward. Good afternoon, honorable chair and members of the council. Thank you for allowing me to testify on behalf of the Building Industry Association, Los Angeles Ventura chapter. 
The House LA initiative to increase housing production and reduce housing costs will benefit all Angelenos by helping to provide housing for all. Los Angeles continues to face a critical shortage in housing combined with a high level of demand, resulting in high rental prices and few home ownership opportunities. The House LA motions will increase the housing supply citywide, allow for growth of flexible housing alternatives, more walkable communities, and opportunities for more public transit while maintaining a strong economy. We thank, counts, uh, excuse me, we thank Housing Chair Councilman Cidio for his vision and thank the committee for their review of the set of motions for which we urge their passage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have you from the United Way, but I can't read your writing. I would probably be sincere about that. Uh, no, Ms. Mann. I have very sloppy handwriting, so say so here I'm Mann. Um, Thank you so much for, for having me here today. I really appreciate it. My name is Zahira Mann. I'm from United Way of Greater Los Angeles, and I work on our Home for Good initiative, which is an effort um, that was initially launched by the LA Area Chamber of Commerce and United Way to end chronic and veteran homelessness in the county of Los Angeles, and also create pathways for ending all forms of homelessness. In that work, I manage our efforts with the Home for Good Funders Collaborative, which is a group of private and public funders that collectively invest in solutions to end homelessness with a focus on permanent supportive housing. We really appreciate all of the efforts um, that you've described here today about how we can help to further facilitate housing for those who are homeless and the synergies that it's creating with the homelessness strategy that's been discussed in the, housing, the Homelessness and Poverty Committee. As part of what we believe is needed to end homelessness, we really look at the amount of funding that's needed for affordable housing. And that funding really balanced as well and comes coupled with the initiatives that you've outlined today. So we want to thank you for, for all of your work on this and we look forward to future partnerships. Thank you so much. Adam? I get Rabia Sen from Esperanza Housing. Mark Villanatos from Abundant Housing, Aaron Jimenez from CCA, ready to come up. Adam. Hey, thank you, good afternoon. Um, my name's Adam Cowing, I'm a staff attorney at Public Council. Um, Public Council is a member of ACT LA, which I think you know is sort of dedicated to increasing access to affordable housing near transit. Um, I'm really pleased that the committee is taking the time to look at these issues, and I know ACT LA is as well. I just wanted to highlight, um, in addition to thanking you for your attention to these issues, I wanted to highlight three points today related to the motions. One is that we recommend any process for giving legal status to unapproved um, dwelling, u dwelling units, and we also just want to urge the committee to consider covenanted housing to ensure affordability in conjunction with those efforts. Uh, the second, um, is that we want to recommend that the city consider land value discounting to support affordable housing on actual city-owned land. The city owns land. Affordable housing is a huge issue. It's not that uh, difficult an idea. Um, and number three is that we urge the uh, committee to coordinate uh, parking strategies with existing affordable housing incentives like the density bonus to make sure that those policies aren't undermined as we appropriate look at appropriately look at ways to uh, uh, decrease parking requirements. What was your first point real quick? First point was uh, accessory dwelling units ah, and just ADUs. considering ways to make them affordable, perhaps through covenanting to ensure affordability in Got conjunction it. with that effort. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rebea? Hi. Um, um, uh, my name is Rabia Sen. I'm with Esperanza Community Housing Corporation. At Esperanza, we work with South Central Los Angeles' communities, those at the intersections of multiple social justice issues, which include housing, health, environmental justice, violence, and racial and economic justice. We strongly believe that housing is a basic health and human right, and we urge you and all our city leaders to please work with our communities, especially those at significant risk of displacement due to inequitable development and rising rents. We firmly believe that a meaningful investment in affordable housing, both in creating new and preserving existing units, is key to building healthy, safe, and sustainable communities. 
And we are also here as part of the Alliance for Community Transit, which Adam spoke so eloquently to. We would like to reiterate his comments and say that, you know, um, ActLA is here because we truly believe that an investment in housing is an investment in our communities and that it is the confluence of all these issues of health, affordable housing, and green space and green communities that will really help propel Los Angeles forward into the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark Vianatos. Yes, hi, I'm Mark Vianatos. I'm a resident of CD1, and I work and teach at Occidental College in CD14. And I'm also with a new group called Abundant Housing LA, which wants to expand uh, all types of housing throughout the city. And I'm speaking I, in support of the Housing LA motions. I think we do need multiple strategies to increase the supply of affordable housing and market housing and permanent and a temporary supportive housing for the homeless. So I encourage uh, the, the committee and the entire city council to, to look into these issues of expanding uh, public space for affordable housing, reducing parking requirements, making it easier to do ADUs, um, increasing the threshold uh, for CEQA review, and the other strategies you outlined. And uh, we look forward to a, an LA where there is abundant housing, housing options, um, housing in great locations, and uh, healthier communities as, as a result. Thank you. Thank you. I have Aaron Jimenez, Dan Rosenfeld, and Catherine Costa. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Aaron Jimenez. I'm here with the Central City Association. Uh, Los Angeles is one of the fastest growing cities in the country, and the demand for new housing continues to rise. Increasing the housing supply and improving affordability remains one of the city's biggest challenges. CCA believes that the six House LA motions introduced by Councilmember Gil Cedillo are a step in the right direction. They are incentive-based policies that seek to increase the housing production by reducing the amount of time it takes to get a new unit, unit online. The House LA initiative presents an excellent opportunity for the city to address the crisis in a variety of innovative and alternative ways that will reduce the cost of housing production and increase the housing supply citywide. For these reasons, we strongly support the House LA initiative and urge you to support the six motions. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Costa, Dan Rosenfeld, Jim Reese, Ray Fukuda, and Alan Greenlee. Hi, my name is Catherine Costa. I'm from um, the architecture developing construction firm Motative. We specialize in small uh, subdivision projects in the city of LA. Um, I support the House LA initiative, and um, I think that this initiative will increase housing production and reduce housing costs, and it will benefit all Angelinos. Personally, I grew up in Florida and came here eight years ago for school, and I started working at Motative right after school. I quickly realized with the extremely high rental housing prices, most of my salary was going to rent. I am part of the young working middle class and the American dream of owning my own home one day just doesn't seem possible with current prices. I support this initiative because it would allow for a greater housing supply and it would give people like me the opportunity to find more affordable housing and the future opportunity to buy my own home someday soon. This initiative allows for accessory dwelling units which would allow, <laughs> just kidding, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosenfeld. Good afternoon. I just want to say thank you. I'm Dan Rosenfeld, a developer of uh, market rate and affordable housing and other products. I appreciate the focus this committee has placed on these issues. They are very important. They're difficult, uh, require a certain amount of courage, and I want to thank you and indicate, at least from our perspective, that the industry supports you in the production of housing in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenfeld. Uh, Ray Fukuda. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ray Fukuda. I am a project manager and planner for the Little Tokyo Service Center and uh, whose mission is to uh, meet critical needs of people and build community through building affordable housing, community development, and social services. 
And LTSC is a member of ACT-LA, um, an alliance for community transit Los Angeles. Uh, we heard some um, speakers on behalf of the coalition before. We're 29 organizations committed to a just and equitable, sustainable transit system and neighborhood for all people in Los Angeles. Um, and we submitted a letter for all of you to review with more information on the points we brought up. I'm going to just highlight um, that we recommend that the city uh, consider meaningful land value discounting for to support affordable housing development. It was mentioned already that it, the costs um, to build affordable housing is uh, different and the, uh, being able to prioritize projects that provide deeper affordability, in particular for projects building units at a 30% area median income makes um, the overall housing supply much more um, targeted towards really uh, very low income families and individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Alan? Sir, who are you? My name is Alan Greenlee. Hey, Grant, Alan. I'm Alan Greenlee, the Executive Director of the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. On behalf of the almost 300 members of my organization and uh, those who have provided uh, about 100,000 homes over the last 30 years, I want to come and support uh, the package. Um, and to uh, express my appreciation for this work and look forward to working with the council, the planning department, and the housing department to implement these creative strategies. And then the last thing I'll say, which is the thing, thing I say to you every time we meet, and that is um, look forward to working with the council and other departments including, and other agencies like the state and the federal government uh, to replenish some of the affordable housing subsidy funds that really are the linchpin to making this um, affordability question, um, addressing the affordability question. So thank you again, thank and you. I look forward to working with you soon. Yes, Brendan? Sir, who are you? Sir, in the brown jacket? I'm coming up, I heard you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brendan O'Donnell, and I'm with Skid Row Housing Trust, yes. uh, a nonprofit developer and provider of permanent supportive housing uh, for individuals who have experienced homelessness, disability, uh, mental illness, and or addiction in their lives. And as an organization that focuses on these issues day in, day out, uh, we both support and sincerely appreciate uh, these measures to increase the city's affordable housing stock and also to um, reduce some of the barriers associated with developing new affordable housing in a timely and efficient manner. Uh, we think that these are some great ideas that will go a long way towards creating desperately needed affordable homes, high quality homes for more of the city's population. Uh, and given the, the magnitude of the homeless population in the city, uh, we hope that these significant first steps will inspire further action uh, towards addressing the needs of the homeless population in Los Angeles and uh, <coughs> provide housing and support for more of these individuals for some of the most vulnerable of our population. Uh, so again, thank you for your support. Uh, we appreciate these measures and we look forward to continued progress uh, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Reese. And uh, Jerry Jones and uh, Adam Lane. Let's get ready. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, Jim Reese for Craig Lawson and Company here speaking in support of the proposals in front of you today. Uh, we have not reviewed this with all of our, our clients, both uh, affordable providers and market rate providers, but believe each one of them would support the list of items you have. Um, I would like to speak about a couple of them really quickly. The parking lots, uh, it makes a lot of sense. I've worked on a couple of projects with LAUSD and abode communities and building housing over parking and it's been a, a, a huge success of those projects. I also have another one happening in West Los Angeles with the city of LA, and it just seems like it's a great use of property. It also, it serves housing needs, but it also increases the aesthetics of the area and has environmental benefits by addressing urban runoff and heat island effects, so it has many benefits. Um, the shared parking, the shared vehicles, I think is a great idea, and I think we could be even a little more aggressive about this. A project that I worked on, um, Roland Curtis, we did some reports on that that showed that you could actually replace up to 15 cars with one shared parking. So I don't think we have any worry about asking for four and urge you to look a little further. Micro units um, won't solve the problems, but is another great aspect to the, the housing um, production that we need. And with that, I just support the, the proposals. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jerry Jones. 
Commissioner of City Law Center. Yes, thanks for, uh, for allowing me to have a moment to comment. Uh, Jerry Jones with the Inner City Law Center. I, I strongly support the uh, proposals. It takes too long and costs too much money to build affordable housing in the city. And City Hall should be doing everything possible to help nonprofit developers of affordable housing and especially uh, developers of permanent supportive housing for people who are experiencing homelessness. And so with these measures and other things that can build on them, I encourage the city to essentially create a special door for those who are trying to create affordable housing in this, um, in this city and expedite that process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adam Lane and uh, Stephen Coulter. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Adam Lane, the legislative director at the LA Business Council. I'm here today to express our strong support for the House LA initiative and thank you, council member Cedillo, for introducing this package of motions. We know from general manager Ray Chan that without efforts to streamline permitting both at DBS and planning, our current development boom will, be, uh, will peak in the upcoming year and begin a drastic decline. To prevent any further increase in our shortage, we must capitalize on this boom, which is why our membership consisting of both market rate and affordable housing developers has chosen to strongly support the initiative. The motions in this package, such as reducing EIR processing times through expansion of planning's expedited processing section, will make the necessary administrative reforms to improve efficiency and increase output of projects that represents billions of dollars in investments, tens of thousands of jobs, and thousands of units. Increasing the city's site plan review threshold from the current level of 50 units was also a key recommendation from the LABC Institute. These projects will be crucial in meeting our housing needs and we should encourage them, not deter them. As such, we strongly encourage this committee to vote in favor of the full pact of motions and thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stephen Coulter. Hi, um, thank you. I'm Steve Coulter. I'm also here at the Los Angeles Business Council. And uh, I wanted to say just a, a couple brief comments in response to uh, the motion to expedite EIRs. And uh, you know, I think the, the conversation today uh, did a great job of explaining why that's uh, an important component of this package to reach our housing goals. Uh, we've been working closely with uh, Council Member Cedillo, with the mayor's office, uh, and this committee as well. Um, on that and would like to help with the, the report back on that on that issue as well. If I can make a couple brief recommendations about uh, you know what would be great to get out of that report would be to you know focus on the administrative improvements that can be made within the department's process to bring those environmental documents to a hearing faster. Um, what time savings can we achieve at different stages in the process? How can we track those with metrics to improve it? And what resources would you need to achieve those efficiency improvements. And if I can make one last comment, the, the reason why the expedited case processing section was an interesting model was because it allowed uh, project applicants to pay an expediting fee to help you know, cover those additional resources needs to, to bring those to hearing faster. So if we can prove those, those metrics and those time savings, then we think that there's you know, a lot of developers that would be willing and interested in, in paying for that expedited service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alicia. from the LA Chamber. I have Guy Panini, Matthew Jacobs. Hi, I'm Alicia Witzling with the LA Chamber. On behalf of the LA Chamber, which represents more than uh, 1,600 organizations and 650,000 employees in the region, um, we're here to support the House LA initiative. Um, it'll help cut red tape and streamline the creation of housing in LA. Creating affordable housing is crucial to the success of LA's economy and an important asset for businesses um, in Los Angeles. A lack of affordable housing has ripple effects in the economy as employers are unable to attract and retain talented employees. As we heard earlier, Angelinos are significantly spending more of household income on rent, which affects their ability to spend on other necessities. Having a healthy housing market necessitates having an adequate supply of homes affordable to Californians at all income levels and plays a critical role in the economic prosperity and quality of life of the state. Uh, this package will help fix this housing crisis. Uh, as a supporter of businesses throughout LA County, the Chamber will continue to advocate not only for businesses, but for people that um, impact the California economy as a whole. And we um, thank you for bringing this important measure before the City Council. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Guy Panini. I grew up in Council District 5 and I live there today. I wanted to come before you to pledge my support for Housing LA and I wanted to say that 
despite the challenges and crisis we have in housing, I think there's a tremendous opportunity. And I want to thank you for your vision and the work, hard work of planning uh, and the people of Los Angeles to get it done. So thanks very much. And thank you for joining us today. Matthew Jacobs. Yeah, my name is Matt Jacobs. I'm a small developer. I live in CD5. I just want to thank you for the leadership, thank the whole committee, and also just encourage, uh, however it's possible, to make sure that development happens, not just in the wealthy areas, that we don't have development battles just in the wealthy areas either, but throughout the city and all the districts. Thank you. Thank you. America Aceves, Proyecto Pastoral. Sissy Trin, Siaka, or Seika. Hi, good afternoon, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Council Members. My name is America Seves, and I'm also a resident of CD1 in Highland Park. I also work for Proyecto Pastoral, located in CD14 in Boyle Heights. And Proyecto Pastoral focuses on supporting grassroots projects that focus on leadership, service, and education. We are here to support the city's efforts in identifying additional resources to help build more affordable housing and also transitional housing. We also strongly support focusing city resources to help build extremely low-income households. Uh, these are for folks who earn less than $17,000 a year. Uh, working on the ground, we directly see the impacts due to the lack of affordable housing. And we know that last year, the county, uh, the LA County Board of Supervisors uh, made a strong commitment to support a multi-year plan to allocate $300 million for their uh, first uh, five consecutive years and $100 uh, uh, million for the following years. We know that in order to address this existing need, it's going to require different uh, mechanisms and resources, so we strongly support these measures. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sissy? Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sissy Trin. I'm the executive director of SICA, the Southeast Asian Community Alliance. And we do youth organizing with immigrant youth in Lincoln Heights and Chinatown, and also are a member of ACT LA. We all know that LA is facing the nation's worst housing crisis, and we're excited by a number of the motions in House LA, in particular the use of um, city-owned land for affordable housing. <coughs> However, we would urge the city to, you know, in its efforts to build more housing in order to alleviate market pressures, that we also maximize opportunities for affordable housing, especially at the deeper affordability levels. Um, as we re-examine development standards such as parking relief and streamlining CEQA, we would urge that the city use this as an opportunity to further strengthen existing affordable housing laws. The vast majority of our residents are extremely low income, which means that they, if they don't have subsidized housing, that they are in fact at risk of homelessness. And so these motions, tying it to affordability is absolutely vital for the safety and future of our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia McAllister. Thank you very much. We don't have a uh, homeless, uh, or I should say, housing problem. We have an illegal alien problem. There are 15 million illegal aliens in, in Los Angeles County. There are 30,000, based on Lassa's count, homeless count, 30,000 African Americans. What you council members are doing, you're letting illegal aliens live in subsidized government housing. Cedillo, you represent most of them, and I saw the chart. The concentration of affordable housing is in the first district. You represent illegal aliens, and I have a problem with you being the chair of this committee. You're getting most of that housing for illegals. Everything you've done since I've been in this room for two hours is for illegal aliens. Building housing, fixing up housing units so that these illegals can house 30 or 40 more people in one house, that's in here also. Get these illegal aliens out of affordable housing and put black people back in these houses and give them their jobs back. Bram Barajas. Chana Grace. Okay. So, what's the issue? And Don Garza. Um, I want to make a clear statement is that. Um, if you look at the uh, disintegration of the economy, my question would be, why is it that people seem to think that if you do this and do that, that it will resolve the issue at hand? What is your problem? 
who screwed the American people? Isn't it Wall Street? Isn't it Wall Street puppets like Obama that screwed the American people out of housing, out of a future? And that's the issue that I bring up today. So if you really want to get at the issue, why don't you, as Americans, collaborate now to save your own damn souls by initiating projects that FDR initiated? You need a top-down issue. What's the issue? We, as Americans, are about to be killed. And what, are, what is our role? Take up the Glass-Steagall issue. Thank you. Don Garza and then Chana. Welcome, Don. Well, one of the reasons why even the homeless people volunteered for Gil Cedillo's campaign for city council. <laughs> this man has been championing the rights of people that uh, are of low income to find affordable housing since he's been an assemblyman. Again, it sounds like a campaign speech I'm making, but I remember that in the state assembly, the very first permanent supportive housing model called the Yankee Hotel when I lived in Skid Row came from tax credits that Gil Cedillo brought to this city. And again, when everybody was saying only build lofts and the, with the ARO, what was Gil Cedillo saying? We can do both. We can build affordable housing, we can build permanent supportive housing, and we can build the condos in downtown all at the same time. Why do we have to do just one or the other? I have complete faith and I support this housing first initiative of Gil Cedillo. We need more micro units so people like me and others that enjoy our micro units can continue to live in them and afford them. I only pay $5.25 a month. Let's keep doing this. Gil, we voted for you and we're going to get what we need. Thank you for speaking for us, Mr. Cedillo and Mr. Thank Price you. also. Thank you, my brother. China Grace. I want to thank the Housing Committee for, and especially uh, Councilman Gil Cedillo for putting forth these motions. Um, they are an important step in the toolbox that is needed to address a staggering issue. 44,000 uh, units are needed for permanent supportive housing, 527,000 units are needed all across the board in affordability. Um, it's important when we're talking about micro units that we make sure that the whatever size is finally landed on, that it, it corresponds to what the feds through the tax credit program administered by the state have as their minimum requirement because that is the way we affordable housing developers are able to build these housing units is that we have to piece together multiple sources of financing and the main linchpin of that is low income housing tax credit. So I just advise you to make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and that we get a bond or something else, uh, multiple ways to increase the coffers to finance this housing. We're talking about multiple billions. Thank you very much. Thank you and thank you for your leadership and congratulations on your most recent project. Thank you. you do God's work. Uh, let me, uh, I'm trying to wait before. Before you close out, let me just uh, say I certainly appreciate the comments made that we are uh, in a real, uh, a real crisis. Uh, affordable housing, special need housing, market rate housing. Uh, um, and so anything we can do to streamline this process, to uh, get more product on the market, to provide housing options, I think we have to. Um, I think we've, we've taken some uh, important uh, steps with these motions. I look forward to the report backs. Uh, and seeing how we how we cooperate and collaborate with the various agencies and other organizations, really bringing through a uh, housing program and a housing policies that uh, get to the need of the, the people that we're trying to serve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership, and I look forward to continuing to work with you as we solve these problems. Thank you. Let me uh, say as a the final recommendation for the record before we go to public comment. Let me know if, you've, if I'm out of sequence. Consolidate all the council files on today's agenda into one council file for a report back on How's LA proposals discussed today. The Department of Planning to work with H HCID and any other relevant departments on a report that should include prioritizing proposals which would have the largest impacts on increasing our housing stock, as well as tailored incentives as proposed in the latest CAO Homeless Strategic Report, specifically Recommendation 7D, 7K, 7L, 7M, and HC, 
uh, along with any other recommendations from the department. So be the order. I just need a nod from here. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion second. Uh, Mr. Wiesar stepped away for a brief second. We are waiting uh, his concurrence, which would then move uh, House LA forward. In the interim, why don't we hear uh, general public comment, if that's okay? General public comment, uh, Adam Lane, you offered a general comment, if you have that option. Ah, before we hear from Mr. Lane, uh, Mr. Wiesar, we moved uh, We move to consolidate the files into today's agenda into one file to report back on House LA. Uh, as discussed today, uh, the planning department will work with HCID and any other relevant departments on a report that should include prioritizing proposals which would have the largest impacts on increasing our housing stock, as well as tailored incentives as proposed in the latest CAO homeless strategic report, specifically uh, the recommendations 7D, 7K, 7L, 7M, and HC, along with any other recommendations from the department. That is the motion. It's been seconded. And that is the order. That's what it said. And any other recommendations and any other catch-alls that uh, will expand the uh, Scope says discuss today. Okay, we have public comment. Adam Lane, Pamela Crenshaw, Kerry Hughes, Betty Marin, Luis Saldivar. Good afternoon, council and members. My name is Pamela Crenshaw. I'm an advocate with CSH, Corporate Supportive Housing, and LASA here in Los Angeles, campaigning for more affordable housing. I am a formerly homeless person myself. I was on Skid Row. I went from a sober living to the community of friends subsidized housing. I have a beautiful studio apartment. I just can't stress enough the need for more housing, and I want to thank you for your efforts in building more units. By having affordable housing, I've been able to have the opportunity to rebuild my life, clean up the wreckage of my past, and I have remained clean and sober for almost 10 years. I humbly ask you to allocate more funds to build more housing and give others like me a chance to change their life as well. Thank you for your efforts and hard work. Thank you, and God bless you. Corey Haynes. Hi, uh, to the members of the Los Angeles City Housing, City Council Housing Committee. My name is Corey Haynes. Um, I'm here to respectfully ask that you reject the plan of champion real estate to displace working people from their homes in order to build yet another luxury apartment complex in Hollywood. Um, the development destroys about 50 units of rent stabilized housing, as well as contributes to the severe problems of traffic crumbling city infrastructure, and a historic water crisis. The tenants of Yucca and Argyle want to stay. We have all agreed to this. The tenants include seniors who have lived in their homes for 50 years. Several families have lived in complex for over 10 years. Many residents are public trans transit dependent and being displaced will negatively affect their employment, access to local schools, and access to medical and senior services, not to mention access to actual affording house, affordable housing. Can you hear me? These are residents that contribute to our city's prosperity, and we should be proud to live amongst them, not have them displaced. 
a better byline should read, LA City Housing Committee is committed to true urban center that supports afford affordable and luxury housing. The byline should not read, LA City Housing Committee supports driving out low income LA residents to build multitudes of luxury com condominiums, hotels and apartments that remain empty. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Betty Marin. Betty Marin, Luis Saldivar. I want to thank the council, uh, the chamber. Thank you guys. Uh, my name is Luis Saldivar. Uh, I have, uh, I'm a resident of Los Angeles. I was born in Hollywood. I uh, lived the majority of my life there. I'm a father and uh, I work in the city and uh, I'm also a member of the LA Tenants Union and I'm here basically to support your uh, your proposals. I, I like what you guys are doing, but I don't like what's happening with EIRs and giving special uh, provisions and variances to developers that are not from the city, that don't deserve those provisions, that, that should not be entitled to any provisions. It, it's, it, it baffles me that you know our, our city leaders and politicians, people that I put in office and that we all put in office, are, are siding with developers instead of the, cons the constituents that put them in office. Um, we are in a housing crisis, and all I wanna say is that this developer is saying that they're gonna include 20 affordable housing units in development, and we know that 20% of, the, uh, of, the of, the, of the units that they're proposing are not gonna cover the 45 households that they're trying to displace. And furthermore, we know that these 45 households will not be able to afford these affordable units uh, being that the, uh, their income puts them below the threshold of the, the affordability established by the city. So I think we need to look at these things and be aware that Los Angeles is not San Francisco, it's not China, it's not Mexico City. We do not have the mobile infrastructure to move people from place to place like, like several cities that have and I think that city planners made a huge mistake back in Los Angeles when they started building our, our, our mass trans, transit system. And we need to go back and revise our transit system and fix it before we start ruining our city and bringing in all these big developments thinking that this Thank is you. what's gonna fix the problem. Thank you. Sylvia Shane, Donald Ryan, Danita Huerta, Good afternoon, honorable chair and council members. My name is Sylvie Shane. As a member of the Los Angeles Tenants Union and a victim of displacement, I am here in solidarity with the residents of Yucca and Argyle who are at risk of being displaced by proposed mega mixed use development in Hollywood. I'd like to take this opportunity to dispel the supply and demand myth that is being used to justify these projects as a solution to our affordable housing crisis. No more than 200 feet away from the proposed site is East Town Apartments, a mixed-use project which I counted today, has 104 vacant units out of 535 total, a whopping 19.4 vacancy while the city vacancy hovers at 3%. Units at $2,400 a month are not serving the demand of our city or driving down the costs for our 50% rent burden residents. We cannot afford to displace another working class resident of the city to make way for a project that does not serve the community. I ask you to recognize that the preservation of existing affordable housing stock is a top priority to help stop the creation of more casualties of speculative development, which only exacerbates our crisis by increasing the demand. Increasing the production of Ferraris will never drive down the price of a Honda. Thank you. Thank you. Donald Ryan, Danita Huerta, yes sir. Thank you, Thank you so much uh, for allowing me to speak. My name is Don Ryan, I'm a long-term resident of Hollywood, I'm also a member of the LA Tenants Union. Uh, I'm here in solidarity with the 45 households of Yucca and Argyle Apartments who have received notice that their buildings will be replaced by a 32-story tower of luxury apartments and hotel rooms. Um, on Oct um, December 8th, we met with um, our staff of our council member, Mitchell Farrell, and he recommended that we come and speak to you on the housing committee as our next step in trying to get support for those residents. So, hello, here we are. 
um, we very much need your support. Um, the, the developer told us on the 29th of September that the residents of Yucca and Argyle need to accept the fact that they are no longer going to be able to afford to live in Hollywood and they need to move further down the red line. What we understood this message to mean is that the, um, that the demolition of rent-stabilized apartments, which is actually our most effective form of affordable housing in the city, is actually on the chopping block. And we ask you to support the tenants. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danita Huerta. Good afternoon. Thank you for having this meeting. We have a problem and it's outrageous and you know it and I'm here respectfully. 23,700 units could be available and we got nothing but excuses from paid people. Paid people? I represent women of all area codes, all nationalities, whether they're foreign here or not. We need housing, not excuses. We've got laws in place, make them happen. If you need a regulator, I got a team. I represent and we're ready. I have done housing in every area code and I'm on the streets available to oversee, to make sure, to get you moving, because we got a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Sajal Patel, Teresa Purcell, Yesenia Morales. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Hello to the members of the Los Angeles City Council Housing Committee. My name is Sajal Patel. And I am a resident of the Yucca and Argyle apartment complex in Hollywood in the District of Councilmember Mitchell Farrell, who asked us to speak with you today. On November 25th, the residents of our rent-controlled apartment complex were notified by your department of a notice of preparation, EIR, and scoping, public scoping meeting for Champion Real Estate's development plan to build a 32-story tower of luxury apartments, hotel, and retail complex that will effectively destroy my home. I respectfully request that the re committee reject the plan to displace working people in order to build a luxury housing complex for Hollywood residents. As you very well know, nearly every vacant building and block in the Hollywood Vine Red Lion area has been under extensive development for the past five to 10 years. These developments have been endless luxury complexes that do not support working people. To prove my point, studies report that, that these developments are actually uninhibited by residents, largely uninhibited, and that Hollywood's population has, in effect, been decreasing since the rise of the developments. It, the population of Hollywood has not been increasing. I respectfully ask that you reject Champion's real estate plan to displace working people to build housing units that will remain em empty. It's one thing to build luxury apartments on empty lots or to demolish empty buildings, but it's an entirely deplorable issue to displace the working people of perfectly amazing rent-controlled housing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and consideration this afternoon. Good afternoon. My How name is Teresa Purcell, and I'm here representing the Downtown Women's Center. I was homeless for 10 years, I'm 65 years old, and today I've been living in a women's center for five years. And I'm here to, to ask for your support to build more facilities such as the Downtown Women's Center because out here right now, I know there is so many mothers, sisters that have nowhere to go and stay and call their home. It's so many advantages in staying in the Downtown Women's Center. I mean, I have my own apartment, I cook my own meals, I have a beautiful kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, and amenities to go to the psychiatrist, to the doctor downstairs. I just ask for your support to build more facilities today, such as the Downtown Women's Center, because it's advantageous to live there, and I have a beautiful, beautiful home. And I'm thankful to be here today to just say thank God and thank the committee and just I'm just asking for your support. In considering on building homeless homes, build more facilities for women because we need it. 
We need it. And thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Yesenia. I was born and raised in South LA. I have been a member of Trust South LA since I was nine years old. Today I am speaking on behalf of Alliance for Community Transit, Act LA, in support of the House LA initiative specifically on the provisions that facilitate accessory dwelling units. I want to thank Council Member Cedillo for putting this motion forward and to thank Councilman Price for previously working with Trust South LA on the issue of ADUs. For more than half of my life, I was living, living with my family in a converted garage in my aunt's house. This allowed my family our own space while still living close to our extended family and was affordable. This all changed when an inspector came and decided our little home was illegal. If the House LA initiative was already in place, I would have not lost my childhood home. I hope that the committee will consider prioritizing the creation and legalization of safety accessory dwelling units and that are, that are affordable to low and very low income households. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Patricia McAllister. As I said earlier, the mayor said he spent 100 million on um, the homeless. And when the press asked him about that, he said, well, you know, they asked him, what did you spend the 100 million on? Because we have thousands of homeless people. He said, oh, we spent it on the police. You spent 100 million on the police watching the homeless? I think we need to get the federal government into Los Angeles and check these books. We need a federal audit. I believe that there's racketeering and everything else going on here. Embezzlement. I think you've, uh, you've hidden away so many millions that you've become cocky. You don't care. And what really bothered me is this committee don't know what's going on. You claim you don't know what's going on. I've been to those meetings upstairs. You're asking questions like you don't know anything. We voted for you. Quit letting these department heads run everything and now they're telling you what they're doing. We need to get all of your reins out of office and get a new young generation in here who care about the people. John Walsh. Brian Barajas. And Wayne. Um, so the only thing that I would say is, um, is one of the things that was brought up is how do you actually govern a government? Um, obviously, we have what I've been stating was a disintegration. How do you stop that disintegration factor? It's in the mind that we actually resolve these issues, these questions of um, pure genocide on the population. Now, Cedillo is fully aware of it. He keeps emphasizing on the urgency of the matter. I'm pretty sure his World War II background under uh, pretty much for me, at least, means that he's competent enough to rise to an occasion. The problem is, is that when cowardly people don't do that, we die. That's a fact. So as, uh, as I make a statement, it's very simple. Glass Eagle, whatever you can do, uh, and push Bassetta and other Congress people to initiate the call that FDR did to shut down the speculative market. That's what's collapsing the whole damn system. We need to rise to that. If we don't, then you're going to get this um, genocide. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, Wayne. I appreciate the committee staying here all this extra time. Four puppets down, one puppet remains standing. Yes, the, Sil the Gilbert Sedillo puppet remains in the puppet show. Today, we had nothing but poverty pimps, mostly here, taking and digging and digging and digging into that pile of cash. And in the end, we're going to get more homelessness because that's what you're doing. You displace rent-controlled people with development. Then developers go bankrupt. The stock market lost another 250 points today. It continues to crash. So we're going to relive 2008, 2009, 2010. You'll be up here going, we're bankrupt and we don't have any more money and we can't give you $100 million for the homeless and ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da It's a puppet show, the puppets. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody who um, participated constructively and with some touch to reality in the meetings today. I appreciate them. I appreciate you. Um, this concludes 
our efforts today. And um, I'm getting a nod, so it looks like I can uh, adjourn this meeting.